tell you, we'll have an open format. So after Dr. Roberts does a little bit of an introduction, uh, we want to open it up for questions. I know some of you looking around, I saw some of you in the audience last night, and you may be here to do some follow-up uh, questions, and this is an opportunity, a good forum to do that. We'll go ahead, um, depending on how many questions there are, uh, probably about an hour till 10.30. Following that time, we will have a book signing. And the books that were available last night, we do have several um, of each of the books available. And uh, Dr. Roberts has kindly agreed to go ahead and autograph those as well. So we'll do that following in the social room uh, directly after the lecture. Um, so without further ado, uh, well, let me just have a show of hands. How many of you were at the formal lecture last night? Okay, okay good. So a lot of you, this is a first experience. Let me just, uh, I know with all the media, you've heard a lot, um, probably read a lot about Dr. Roberts. Dr. Roberts was one of uh, what we, we call in history now as the Little Rock Nine, one of the nine high school students who was first to integrate Little Rock. Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. And last night he shared some of the poignant stories of the difficulty and the fear in being that first group uh, of students and what he had to overcome in order to stay. And we talked a little bit last night about his mother, and as a parent myself, I thought to myself, I don't know as a parent, let alone as the student, whether I could have gone through that, um, that just intense drama as it unfolded day after day. What some of you may not know is that Dr. Roberts never got to continue in high school because in order to keep uh, integration from furthering, all of the high schools were closed in the state for the following year. So he has another story that goes on about what he, he did from there. But I would encourage you all to read about this history because this is foundational to um, what we're striving for here uh, in the United States, that we, we don't just live side by side, but we live together. <coughs> so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Terry Roberts. See, my thinking was this. The job of a student is to learn. They have no other responsibility. As Becky's parent, I was in charge of food, housing, clothing, transportation, contributions to charity, vacations, and any other financial necessity that she might incur. Her sole job was to learn. And if that was her sole job, then why not her days? She had an intact brain. Nothing was wrong with it. I am convinced that all of us have a brains if we have, don't have brain damage. 
Now, some of you as students might have chosen at some time in the past to use your A brain in the service of earning some other grade, but that's my choice. You do not have to do that. There's no reason on earth for that ever to happen. Now, some of you may think, wow, that's too big a burden to lay on me. Absolutely not. Life is too demanding for you to be mediocre. Strive for excellence, always. My first grade teacher told me, Terry, you've got to become the executive in charge of your own learning. You've got to become the CEO of your own educational enterprise. And I took the words to heart early on, and it paid off. And so once you develop the habit of learning, it becomes a lot easier. Oh, well, I know for some of you it may be hard to pay attention, especially in this age of distractions. Things happen very quickly. We live in a virtual throwaway society. We throw away not only goods, but people, <laughs> unfortunately. But in any case, uh, it's probably enough of me rattling on. Let's start our dialogue, and we will start with your questions or comments to get us going. And whoever has the first question from now on, since I don't have the script in front of me, I don't know who you are. You will have to self-identify. Yes. What has stuck with me since last night is, is the question of how you go through the kind of um, this deep uh, hatred and fear, um, the experiences you talked about last night. How do you come out of it at this point in your life with so much gentleness and kindness? Um, that's, uh, I'm thinking about that a lot, and I, I, I'm wondering if you, if you have been able to figure out the mechanism of how you have come out of it um, yes. so whole. Actually, I have. I was quite fortunate to have been blessed with a mother who was all wise. This woman told me so many things. She told me early on, she said, Terry, you do not have enough life force to hate. Hate is luxurious. It costs a lot. You cannot hate. She said, you have about enough life force to sustain you for roughly 80 years. In the lifestyle, zero to 80. She said, you might live to 80, but you might not. Very realistic one, too. If you live to 80, she said, count on your space being vacant very soon after that. So once I had that picture in my mind, she said, now, you can choose to use up your life force, sustaining you through those 80 years and living a healthy, productive life, or you can fritter away some of it in the name of hating others. But keep in mind that if you hate somebody, you pay the entire freight. They pay nothing. They get away free. And so I said, wow. <laughs> okay. So I choose not to hate. And you, know, you don't have to. You know, that's another thing. You don't have to hate. It's by choice. In fact, everything human beings do is by choice. You know, there's nothing on earth you can create. You have no creative powers. You cannot even destroy anything. Think about it. You can participate in the transformation of a substance from solid to ash and gases, let's say, if you ignite it. But that energy remains, you cannot destroy it. The only thing we can do as human beings is choose between the available options. In fact, that's my definition of education, knowing the options. The more options you know, the more educated you are. And unfortunately, some people tend to go through life exercising one or two options over and over and over, <laughs> as if they were the only ones. It was good enough for my grandfather, good enough for my father, good enough for the universe. <laughs> How often have we heard that? No, it is not good enough. There are many more. How many options in the universe? Billions of them. How many do you know? Very few. <laughs> and when you think about it, when you subtract how much you know from how much there is to be known, what remains is your storehouse of ignorance. And let me tell you, folks, that is something that is very, very large. <laughs> Extremely large. But you don't have to despair about it. You can simply decide that you're going to increase your awareness. Every morning when you get up, you know without doubt your agenda includes learning. And it never stops. It never stops. Okay. Again, I reiterate, this is dialogue. We talk together. <laughs> you and I. Um, we had a discussion on social studies methods class recently that we were talking about news. What do you think about the initiatives that have surfaced recently and surfaced every <coughs> about legislatures in various states, for instance, who are drafting um, apologies to African Americans or Native Americans for past wrongs and things. Well, 
Well, I, I, I'm okay with that. Um, it doesn't do much, but you know, it's all right. <laughs> I gotta do something. <laughs> I'm not doing much of anything else. You know, I, I actually have to discourage about what people do because I imagine that if they really are interested in learning more or get beyond whatever position they are stuck in at the moment. So I, uh, <laughs> most of what we do is hard to support, you know, in terms of the overall picture. But yeah, like I say, apologies are important. Yeah. And maybe if you continue to apologize, maybe something will trigger something else and you'll get beyond apology to really begin to understand dynamics and trying to then alter some and then act to help others change. There's always something positive to be pulled out. You know, people get involved in all kinds of arguments all the time. I never do. I'm, I'm usually sitting on the side now smiling, just watching them go. <laughs> uh, and then I'll maybe say something to change the course of the discussion. I get a lot of flack for that from my friends. They get so engaged in the argument, they enjoy the process. And they say, here you come along with reason.
Yes. Uh, as I was driving to work this morning, I listened to the interview that you gave to public radio. It was in the morning. Yeah, it was yeah. in the morning. So, uh, and you mentioned that we live our monochromatic lives pretty much. Yes. And it's, it really struck me because I came from what used to be Czechoslovakia, and that is definitely. Right. I mean, you know, I, I, I've seen first person of any other color than mine when I was maybe 10 or 11. Right. So it was definitely, you know, for me, come here was like, wow, this is wonderful. You know, people look different, things are different. And I was thinking about it, are we turning back again? Because when you look at schools, a lot of schools are white schools, black schools. My son lived in Anacostia. He said, he saw maybe two other white people who well, live there. Schools are all no, black. We, Aren't we, we turning back? We're not turning back. We're not turning back. We never turned we anywhere never else. Turned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're not turning back. You see, in this country, we are devoted to maintaining those walls of separation. Now, a lot of people won't believe that, or at least they won't say it out loud. But the fact is true. I mean, you look around you. How can you deny the evidence? Most of us. Not all, but most of us live in these monoracial lives. You know, interestingly enough, my wife and I live in a neighborhood in Pasadena that some people refer to as an all-white neighborhood, which I say is ridiculous. We live here. <laughs> <laughs> then I further explain to them that this is really a black neighborhood with a large percentage of white residents. <laughs> it's just a matter of perspective, how you look at it. Then I further tell them the reason I live here in this particular neighborhood is because I never have to worry about the streets being cleaned, the lights are always working, people obey the traffic signals, you know. That has some sociological implications, of course. <laughs> but it's about being aware of your surrounding you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this is America. <laughs> I'm now, still learning. We, we, <laughs> we're, we're going to change it. I keep saying that. And I keep telling my grandsons, patience, kids, we're working. But they're growing. So we gotta hurry. Gotta get going right here in where are we? Salt. Salt. <laughs> Now, I think at this point in my life, I could probably feel very comfortable 
at that home on the front row at a Ku Klux Klan meeting. Oh yeah. Because I understand where they're coming from and it had nothing to do with me. Okay. They don't like me coming to this. That's not that's not what they do. Millions of people I know don't like me. In fact, I was drawn to a particular uh, psychologist by the name of Albert Ellis early in my life. He's a curmudgeon sort of. But he has some good ideas. He says, whoever gave you that idea that people are supposed to like you? <laughs> I said, wow, I like this. <laughs> There's nothing written on the walls of the universe that says people are supposed to like you. Okay. But do you like yourself? That's the essential question. Do you like you? If you like yourself, then that's the message you'll give to other people. I like me. You don't like me, you're missing out. Okay, you know. It's about self-confidence, self-esteem, a high level of evaluation of self. And then as you walk through life, go learn it. So a lot of people are wondering, how did you get to learn anything except with all that stuff going on? And again, it had nothing to do with it. We were goal-oriented. We were there to educate ourselves. We were not there to defend ourselves against white kids, or to defend off what they were saying to us, but to focus on our own education. That's a big difference. It's hard, there's no question about it. And you have to take measures to take care of yourself. And you find out, because it's different for everybody, whatever it is that you need to recharge, to ease your emotional pain, because all this will happen. You, know, you can't just gloss over and say it's, it's easy to do. But it can be done. It can be done. No question about it. If you want it. Ah, that's a different thing. Sometimes people want life to be easy. They even have this commercial for staples, easy button. <laughs> I think that's playing into a lot of our fear about life. It's too hard. I shared with students uh, the other day, I was like, just yesterday actually, right here in this room, a group of students from the LLC. I was telling them about my brother. My brother teaches fourth grade in Long Beach. One day, three of his students came to him and they said, Mr. Roberts, we need to talk to you for fourth grade. You are too hard. It's too hard in this classroom. You've got to slack off. He put his arms around me. He said, boys, I understand there's room in the third grade. <laughs> <laughs> they backed up. <laughs> yeah, you've got to deal with the reality of being in the fourth grade. If it, you can't deal with it, then go back to third. Get yourself ready. He's like that. My brother's not hard, but he is insistent upon kids learning. And he will work as hard as they do to learn. He learns along with them. Which is another thing, for those of you who are planning to be teachers, I think some of you are here, I would ask you to think about that whole concept, teacher. You know, that's actually a misnomer. Teacher implies that you know something, that you can teach others. You don't know enough to do that. But what you can do is take on the label of learner, and you can model learning in the presence of students. That's what your main job is, to model learning. To show them how much value is there, how much fun it is, how much you gain from it. And then not only demonstrate, but then show the results of that learning in your own life, through your own choices, you see. If you are supposedly a teacher, in my terms, a learner, and you're making unhealthy choices, the two don't go together. The more you learn, the healthier your choices get. Yeah. I walked in here yesterday, one of the first things I noticed is a big round of vase outside filled with sand, and on top of that sand they're stuck in cigarette butts, like some sort of uh, art design. And I'm thinking, at college, people still smoke cigarettes? You know? Well, some of you may think, what's wrong with him? Why is he attacking cigarettes? <laughs> well, you think about it. See, there's nothing at all healthy about that choice. That is inherently unhealthy. What it signifies to me, somebody who smokes probably is not leaning in the direction of making healthy choices. Now, I will never take a cigarette out of your hand. I will not do that. I will not blow out your light. But I will engage you in conversation about it. I was out with my wife one day, we were in an outdoor cafe, and a man sitting at the next table lit up. So I engaged my wife in a conversation loud enough for him to overhear. This was all by design. I wanted to try and draw him in. Sure enough, it worked. He says, pardon me, uh, I just stand for what you're saying. You don't enjoy the smoke. I said, right. He said, well, I'll put it out. So he put it out. Then he pulled his chair over and we began to have dialogue, which was what I wanted anyway. I love that process of interchange. And 
He said he wanted to hear more about it. I said, actually, when I see you smoking, I am concerned about my own health because the stats on secondhand smoke are uncompromising. They kill. Secondhand smoke kills. But more than that, even more than my own health and safety and well-being, I have mental images that are so disturbing. Because when I see people smoking, I don't think about the condition of their lungs or them getting emphysema or cancer or any of that stuff. My mind goes all the way back to the tobacco fields in this country when slave labor was used to build these obscene fortunes currently being enjoyed by Williams and American Tobacco and all these other tobacco companies. They didn't get that money as a result of their own labor. It was because it was free labor that they were able to reap those profits. That's the scene that I see. And I don't like it. And so it's about knowing what your perspective is and understanding about it. Anyway, those of you who smoke in here, pardon me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I say that because once I said something like this, I got a strong letter from a personal audience. You just don't know. <laughs> she defended her smoking. That's okay. She didn't leave a return address. <laughs> I thought that was unique. It is a big 
job, there's no question about it. And there are lots of reasons, more than those two, why people make feel that way. I would say to your daughter, though, uh, not to feel the need to be discouraged about it, but simply to find ways to navigate that terrain. The important thing about life is to understand that it will always be difficult to a certain degree. That's never going to change. But you can change your approach to it. Yeah. It's sort of like uh, if your daughter were the kind of person who would see this as a barrier, and she would go running into it, and she'd bruise, and then sit there and say, why is that barrier there? And then the next day, run back into it again. <laughs> then I would say she had to learn much. <laughs> You've got to learn the first time, wow, it's a barrier there. Don't go further running into it again. Figure out a way to get around it, over it, through it, under it, whatever. But deal with it, okay? And that's about learning about yourself, what you can do, what you can do to figure it out. In concert with people who are willing to engage you in dialogue about it as well. You may not have all the answers yourself, so include other people in that discussion. Okay. So, yes? Oh. Uh -huh. I have a whole load of questions, but I'm going to take the first one. Considering your experience, the Arkansas experience, and just looking at the surface of that, you see it was a fight or reaction against segregation. But I'm thinking it, it's a bigger purpose behind the whole incident. And then I'm thinking, um, I think about the purpose of it all, then I connected with the progress and where, you know, I want to be able to see the progress because we live in a generation now that's so far removed from that incident that they might not even have an inkling of it. They might not even have been introduced to it. And my thought is, is um, that uh, when I see more African Americans getting an education in the prison houses than in the school houses, I wonder uh, about the progress and the purpose of certain such incidents as Arkansas and Martin Luther King marches and the whole, you know, the whole nine yards. So, I mean, that's, that's my thought. We, how do we, how, where, where do I see the progress? It's you, want to, you want to see some progress for you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, and when I live in my community, in my neighborhood, and I see more of my, more of my uh, uh, children on the street corners and on the school sets, rather than in the school classroom, then I, I need to know uh, what are we doing, or what should we do, or how much more can we do? You understand? You know. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a good question about it. Um, and there are a lot of complex reasons why all of this is the way it is, and it's not an easy question to answer. How one kind of intervenes, quote, gets progress going. I actually don't know the, the entire answer to that. I do know that there are voices out there on both sides of the continuum yelling and screaming. You, know, you have the far right, you have the far left, and everything in between. None of them are really making sense these days. Uh, a lot of it from all over the continuum is sort of self-serving. So I think at some point, and this is a dream I have, that reasonable people come together and deliberate. Someone once asked me, because the LA, Los Angeles Unified School District is in such a disarray. How can we fix it? And I said, we need to blow it up, get rid of it. We need to send every school-aged child out of the country and stamp their visas cannot return for two years. Keep them out of the country for two years. And then those of us who remain would begin to rebuild the educational system from the ground up. One of the first things we would include in that is teaching about critical thinking teach kids how to think critically about all things. But meanwhile, these kids in the two-year hiatus would be learning, they would be circling the globe, because a lot of American kids never get outside the county where they live. That's an education in itself, to go tracing around the globe. Then they'd come back, hopefully they'd be ready to partake of what we had to offer which would include that base, as I said, critical thinking, but it would also include massive amounts of fundamentals. How to read. How to read with comprehension, not just the skim of the words. How to compute. There's nothing more basic than that, and we need those skills. Uh, they're lacking, you know. I would also include uh, foreign language instruction. 
You miss out on a lot when you are limited to using one language in life. There are nuances that escape you because you don't have words for them. You know, that's okay. So, um, it's going to require some, oh, I think some upheavals, really. Scott Peck talks about this. He says, we collectively live in what he calls pseudo-community. We have a surface that seems very nice. We're civil to each other. Hi, how are you doing? Let's have lunch, you know, that's right. But <laughs> we don't have any deep connections. He says, in order for us to get from pseudo-community to true community, where we really give a rip about it, we've got to break up that surface. And that is hard to do because it does create pain in other people. You know, it's like a farmer who has a field of marigolds, and those marigolds are beautiful. It is springtime and they're just blooming. But he knows in order to feed his family in the winter, he needs to plant corn. In order to plant corn, he's got to plow up the marigolds. That tears at him because it's so beautiful he doesn't want to destroy it. But eventually, if he's real, he's got to zoom out with his plow and just rip up the marigolds, plant the corn, and get on with life. We are not willing to let go of the marigolds. Okay. Even though we know the winter will be harsh. We're going to go with this side, because the dialogue is sort of skewed. <laughs> All right, gang, you're on. That's good. He's looking around. It's him. OK, if you did have a question, what would it be, sir? <laughs> Talk to me. I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. Are you uh, your student here? What's your major? Elementary. Elementary. What are you going to be teaching those kids? What am I going to be teaching? Mm -hmm. That is the question. Knowledge. Aha! Uh -huh. How expansive that is. <laughs> and where is he going to get this knowledge? Return. Go ahead. Okay, great. Okay, number two. Don't do this dumb thing. These are all funny elementary teachers. Okay. I'm an elementary student. I need to know something. What do I need to know? Instantly loved when I walked by. 
embraced by all those present. My idea of myself grew geometrically every day because of that input. And so we can do that if we want to. Now, what will get in the way, of course, are these notions about the validity of separation. See, there are many, many people who feel at the bone marrow level that God said, thou shalt not use. Yeah, they do. Sometimes ministers will underscore that from the pulpit and will say, in so many words, this is how it should be. And so rather than return to those sort of tragic times, we need to take from that time all that was good and build on that to take all of what is good today and there's something good today. And put that together and go forward. Now, I think one of the first things we have to do, though, is to destroy this notion of race. See, there's no such thing as race. Biologically, it has never existed. Scientists have known this for years. The unfortunate thing is, though, the construct continues to exist. It's mythological, and yet we grasp it as if it has validity. But in truth, there is no such thing. Now, some of you are wondering, well, what about all these differences? Well, difference in this period. That's all you have to do. In the universe, there is a finite pool of genetic components. The Human Genome Project will prove that beyond doubt. One finite pool of genetic components. All of us pull unique combinations of genetic components out of that pool. So much so that there is nobody on Earth who shares your DNA. Your DNA is unique. If there were such a thing as race biologically, each of you would have to have your own race. And when you die, your race would become extinct immediately. But in fact, difference is, and difference is accounted for. Now the problem is we tend to evaluate difference. We tend to judge it. We tend to create hierarchies of difference. <coughs> this particular set of genetic components is much superior to that set of genetic components. How absurd, how utterly absurd. And yet we believe that in the thinking. I think if you walk the streets of South America and you inquire of people, what is your race? They would tell you. They know. It's all fake. They don't know that part. And so the idea is for us, especially those of us who are going to be elementary school teachers, you've got to be able to understand this concept so you can teach your students because they need to know it early in life. That this thing of race and focus. Okay. Yes. We have to look at our mindset, you see. 
And when we look at that, really look at it, it is disturbing. It's quite disturbing. But Jonathan Kozol put part of it very succinctly in the preface to his book, Death at an Early Age. He wrote in there, one of the most criminal things we can do to school-age children is to meet them with minimal expectations. Okay. That's one part of it that I think we can do now. We could move those level of, that level of expectations up really high. Okay. Uh, because sometimes, in their liberal state of mind, teachers will do things they think are productive and maybe assist in some way, like uh, promoting students without teaching them how to read <laughs> or how to learn. I, uh, I had a second experience once in my life. I was already in, in college, a sociology class. The instructor said, uh, how many of you intend to go into graduate school? About four or five of us raised our hands. He said, okay, you automatically get A's because it's going to require a high GPA to get into grad school. Wow. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Okay. Stuff like that. Then people get the wrong idea. So as hard as it is, you have to meet people with high expectation. And it's important to give them a realistic assessment. Life is hard. You know, no doubt that. Yeah, what you're facing is ridiculously hard. And yet, here you are. What are you going to do about it? Put that burden on the kid. But also be supportive as you are, you know, because that's important. I think the relationship is so vital. And I've been fortunate enough in life to have developed relationships with people along the way that really helped me to continue. Mr. Campbell. Mr. Campbell was my neighbor. He was a man, when I met him, probably in his late 60s. But he understood work. He knew how to work. He hired me as his assistant when I was eight years old. And we cleaned the YWCA. And Mr. Campbell took me there, and he said, Terry, here's what you do. And he taught me how to clean. We cleaned the Y thoroughly. When we finished with the Y, you could eat off the floor. And he said to me, now one part of this is, we do this job, this well, the first time. The next time around, it won't be so long. Wow. <laughs> and so we did this repeatedly. He kept telling me bits of wisdom along the way. Wonderful one. He didn't pay anything. Like an interest. <laughs> okay. Uh, some kids today, they won't work unless they get paid. But you know, learning about work is vital. You know, maybe you won't get paid in the first job. But it, it's, uh, oh, there's so many things, so many things. Because our society is, is such a uh, really imbalanced, skewed place. You know. For instance, 5 to 7% of the population controls over 95% of the world. Okay? Does that keep you up at night? <laughs> it causes me some suicides. A few people controlling the majority of the wealth, something's wrong with that. Okay? We need to think about redistributing the wealth of the nation. Now that is not a popular notion. It won't win you any votes. You might even get shot at. So be careful. <laughs> but think about it. Okay? Think about it. Because not only does this small group control the wealth? But a vast majority of the other people who don't have it aspire to be in that small group. So they don't want things to change yet. Wait until I get there. You know, that's the problem. So we have to alter our own mental maps, too. We have to understand that life is not about greed or selfishness. And by the way, those are my two answers to what's wrong with America. Greed and selfishness. Okay. Yeah. And you can tell what Mr. Cheney has said. Level of acceptance? Oh yeah, yeah, we did. But see, the problem was the opposition was so strong. Anybody who made a move toward us in a positive way got placed on the nigger lover list. And once you were on that list, you were targeted by stream lockers. So then there was no incentive for people to reach out. So I think there were some people who would have, could have, might have, but because of the opposition were afraid to. And I think that continues in many ways today. A lot of people are silent bystanders, wondering, you know, I guess the supreme example would be Kitty Genovese in New York, who was stabbed at the attacker actually returned to complete the job and the bystanders did nothing. Uh, that mentality is corrosive spirit. 
Acting is important. You know, having a sense of agency in life is important. Doing things. Not because other people do it, but because you want to do it. I talked to a group of young boys in high school once. Most of them were wearing their pants somewhere around their kneecaps. <laughs> and then they were too big. And the first time I saw that, because I hadn't seen it, I thought, well, maybe it's conservation. <laughs> maybe they buy the pants too big this year, they'll feel it next year. Well, that proved to be erroneous. And I talked to the kid, I said, what is this? They said, well, Dr. Roberts, that's sagging. They call it sagging. I said, well, I can see that. That's not any of the movement. That's obvious. <laughs> sagging. But why are you sagging? They didn't know the answer. I said, you know what, kids? I think I know the answer. When you go to prison, wardens will confiscate belts and shoelaces because either one of those things could become weapons of homicide or suicide. So prisoners sag and flop because they have no choice. Why are you sagging and flopping and you're not yet in prison? They had no answer for that. In fact, they responded with some anger that I've used to suggest that. But psychologically, psychologically, they don't know what's happening. When you engage in behavior, the brain records it. So if you walk around town with your pants sagging and your shoes flopping, you are becoming inured to life in prison. And when you get there, it will seem like home. Because everybody is looking the same way. They don't, they don't understand that. They think I'm exempt. No, you're not exempt. Nobody's exempt. Choice matters. Choice matters. What you do today dictates what you can do tomorrow. Okay? If that young man in the red cap chooses to drink too many Coronas today, he is going to be impaired tomorrow. Okay. I don't know if you know this, but the ingestion of alcohol in prodigious amounts actually kills off brain cells. Brain cells do not regenerate. Okay, just talk to George about that. Yeah. Yes.
called me up laughing. She said, Dad, you won't believe what your grandson has packed to come to visit you. I allowed him to pack his own suitcase. He threw in a couple of pairs of underwear, his Spider-Man outfit, and books. <laughs> <laughs> That's his approach to life. Oh, yeah. So you have to excite people and inspire them. Yes, sir. You know, again, if we go back to my concept about selfishness and greed, I think politics in general has become so vitiated by these notions of getting into office not to serve the people, because that's what the position says it is, public service, but you find politicians who are there to mine their own coffers. Recently I saw this report about to the um, lobbyists who, well, they're, they're former legislators who are now lobbyists. But before they became lobbyists, they were pushing for this bill to get through. And that is repeated. It doesn't matter what the bill is, it could be anything. But they push for it. And then the manufacturers, the corporations are so gracious, so grateful for it, that they then hire these folks as lobbyists at millions of dollars per year. So that, that sort of thing is going on, much more than people sitting down and thinking, okay, now we have a problem with education. We need to really focus on what to do about this. They don't care about education. I'm convinced of that. Because if they did, we would see a very different result. A very different result. Uh, I was really upset with George II when he put in his first secretary of education. Okay? He chose a man who really had very little qualification. I mean, on paper he did, certainly, but in, in essence, he, he didn't know what he was doing. But that was in George's point, see. He didn't care much about his age for himself. He was at best a C student. You wonder how the man ever got through law school, huh? And I have my notions. But that is another story. <laughs> Yes. I want to first of all thank you for your definition of education. I really like that. Thank you. And I want to ask you, how did you, you had um, expressed a desire early in your educational life of wanting to change your community. And I want to know, once you received your doctoral degree, how did you use that as a catalyst to change your community right away? Well, you know what? Um, first of all, in my estimate, it's not so much the degree that does anything. Sometimes my students ask me, you know, we have a master's program in psychology. They say, what can I do with this degree? I say, you can do this degree. No. But what you can do is accept this degree as a way of entering certain portals that might not be open to you otherwise. So it's like a key. You open the door. You get in. But you might as well park your degree at the door once you enter. Because it is not going to do anything. But you, having absorbed the knowledge, the wisdom, and the information, and take that, transform it based on who you are, and do all kinds of things. Miracles and wonders, really. And so my thought has always been to get a true education, which had nothing to do with formal institutions. Going through these formal institutions is sometimes just like jumping through hoops. And then once you learn how to jump through the hoops, you're fine. You've mastered that process. But did you learn anything? That's the question. We can. We can learn because we educate ourselves. The institution doesn't educate. You educate yourself through your own efforts. And so my focus has always been community because I am convinced that we live in relationship to each other. We do not live alone. None of us live alone. We are connected initially by an umbilical. We come into the world connected. And that connection continues. And we, all in this room, have very close connections. Not all of us know that, or realize it, or are happy about it. But indeed, it is true. What I do impacts what you can do, and vice versa. Once we begin to really understand that collectively, this whole world will transform immediately, because we will care about each other. One small example, when I drive on the freeways of America, 
I am constantly on the alert for what other people need to do. If I see the least sign that a person needs to get over, I back off and make space. Ahead of time. A lot of people don't understand that. I used to use my blinker in LA. Signaling that I wanted to fool. And generally the response was zoom. Not on my watch. As if the hybrid was owned by that person. So I stopped using the blinker. I regret having to do that. I would prefer that people would realize my intention through observation and then make way, but they do not. They do not. They do all kinds of things. One time I even saw a person roll down his window and flick out a cigarette butt, a used cigarette, just put it on the street. And I looked around to see if he had a second car with a big scoop on it to pick it up. And lo and behold, there was no baby. Since then I've seen a lot of people do that. Unconsciously, it seems. What is their thought process? What are they thinking about? Destroying the environment that way. And it's not just those folk. I see teenagers who will unwrap a candy bar, and the trash receptacle is within five feet, and yet they drop it on the sidewalk and keep walking, as if that were the most appropriate thing to do. What's going on there? What is that about? I was at the beach with a family group. We were leaving. I'm gathering up supplies. I say to a young kid, she's about seven, would you mind picking up that soda can? And you know what she said to me? You got it. It's not mine. That wasn't what I asked her. I didn't ask her if that is that your can. I asked her to pick up the can. She got into ownership. She didn't pick it up. I had to add that to my own stack. It wasn't so much about who owned the can, it was about the fact that the can belonged in the receptacle. Why are people having such a hard time figuring that out? We live in the world together. This is our place, okay? You can't dirty it up because this is not where I live. A lot of people who are living in rental property will destroy the property because they say, I don't own it. How ridiculous. <laughs> How utterly ridiculous. Yeah, my wife and I rented when we were young, but we let each rental improved through our own efforts. That's what it's all about, folks. We made it nice for the next inhabitant. Yeah, yeah. It's not about self, it's about us. One of the most important books I ever found for my kids, and I can't find it again, but I need to, has a simple title, You, Me, Us. I love that title. You, Me, Us. Because that's what it's about. You and me for us. It's not about me and they, or me and them, those others. No. We collectively live on the planet. And it's serious business, because if we don't understand that, there are a few people around whose attitudes and ideas are so warped that they're going to destroy the place. We, as a nation, along with other nations in the world, have enough firepower to blow up Earth. We could blow up the Earth tomorrow if we put all of our bombs together. And what would we have accomplished? I would say, probably time for us to pat ourselves on the back, congratulate ourselves for having had the wisdom to come up with this kind of destructive power, and then put that aside and turn that same energy toward learning how to live in peace. Will we do that? Probably not. Probably not. Because most of us get turned on to blowing things up. That's why a lot of these movies are so successful. The more it's definitely blow up, the higher the box office. Yeah, there's a guy in Vegas. I read about it recently. Purchased some property in Las Vegas, a big empty lot. And his attraction is people can come there and blow stuff up. He puts old cars, old refrigerators, and old couches out there with some detonating devices underneath, and you can trigger those detonating devices with the fire from an AK-47 or a rocket held rocket launcher. And you pay money to do this, but you get the thrill of blowing stuff up. And on the news report, a young woman was interviewed, she'd been there. She said, this was the biggest thrill in my life. I'm going back home and work and earn more money so I can come back and blow up some more stuff. And my first thought was, what if she goes charging out there to blow stuff up and the place is closed? What's she going to do then? <laughs> oh man, that's scary. <laughs> Any case, uh, I think we're going to have to go. It's our time. And uh, I have appreciated this. Thank you for being here. I wish you well. It's summer.